Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good evening, good good everything, good 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 everything. So, uh, welcome to on .NET Live. I'm your host David Pine, along with co-hosts Cecil Phillip and Brady Gaster, and we've got a special guest today that I'm happy to introduce, Johnny Hoyabrix. So, Johnny, please say hello to the world. Hello, world. <laughs> Sounds like that .NET application I I always wanted to write. Um, <laughs> Yeah, hi. So my name is uh, Tony Hoibrix, and I'm here today to show uh, some things that I did uh, with Orleans, basically. Sweet. Awesome. Um, great. Well, yeah, we'll we'll learn more about you as we go through here. Uh, so let's uh, let's jump into related bits where I'll share a little something. So today's related bits, uh, we're going to talk about Orleans um, and I'm trying to do all the stuff here behind the scenes. I'm trying to press the buttons and do the transitions. And uh, so this is going to be fun. It's going to be totally live, as is uh, all of our shows, right? So uh, this article, Deploy Orleans to Azure Container Apps, uh, I, I wrote this late last year and it was based on a shopping uh, shopping cart application for Orleans. Um, and it just walks you through basically taking an app, adding um, Azure Active Directory business to consumer authentication and deploying it to Azure container apps. Um, and it's pretty in-depth. There's, there's a quite a few steps here. There's a lot of moving parts, uh, but I think that's okay because uh, I think we do an okay job of explaining all the different things and um, making it, uh, you know, explaining all the different options. You know, you can use the Azure portal or the Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell. Uh, we get into Bicep and uh, we talk about GitHub secrets and GitHub actions. And like I said, there's a bunch of interesting things here. So I hope that you check this out and I hope it piques your interest and I hope that you are eager to learn more. And with that, I think we can just skip over this and go right into the hallway track where we're going to learn a lot more uh, about something more interesting, I think, right? <laughs> bet. So now this is the fun part because I, uh, I'm i a bit biased. I'm not a big fan of the related bits section. I would love to hear what our viewers think of the related bits sections. We've been doing that for years now. So I'm curious if y'all think it's a waste of time or if you really enjoy it. Um, but at any rate, uh, let's highlight Johnny and get Johnny here. You're sharing your screen and you've done something really, really interesting. Um, and I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but I know that when we met preemptively, you had shared that you weren't using Orleans initially with, uh, the game that you build, but then you decided to use Orleans and I'm, I want to start learning about that right away. And I want you to share some of your experiences with that. All right. Uh, before I get into that, let's just give you a little bit more context of, of, mm -hmm. of where I'm from. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from Belgium and I was, I was always creating software applications since actually I was a, a teenager. Um, and throughout the years and also after I, I started doing it professionally, I always had an eager to, to teach other people on how to do the things that I could do in, in, in software. Um, so yeah, professionally, I'm today I'm a, a software developer consultant for a consultancy firm in Belgium. And then many years ago, uh, actually starting in 2010, I was teaching uh, in night school. So here in Belgium, we have these night schools where adult people can go to learn things and 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 basically get a diploma um, on a later age. And, and maybe when they were young, they didn't have the time or they didn't have opportunities to study, um, to go to school. So they can actually do it uh, later on while they have a job, go to school during the evenings. So I thought this would be really cool for me to teach these people how to develop using Microsoft related technologies like C Sharp and .NET. Um, and the first years I was I, that I was doing that, um, I got bored of doing the same console applications over and over again, because it's, it's actually very hard to teach people the basics of programming when doing too complicated applications. But then again, you need to use console applications for all the basic stuff, like what are variables, what are uh, control structures and loops, stuff like that. 
Um, but that's also quite boring for, for many people, especially adult people, because they have lived their lives and they have seen some incredible things. And now just staring at a black screen is, is kind of boring. So that's when I decided to uh, create a little game, which I called C Sharp Wars, um, where I have a virtual uh, arena that has some robots fighting each other to the death, which is always more interesting than a console application, right? Um, and in order to make your robot do something, you needed to write some piece of C-sharp code. So now these students learning the basics of C-sharp could, could actually practice and immediately seeing a result and, and for example, their robot actually dying, um, which, which meant they had more fun and they learned more quickly um, while while writing C sharp code, and uh, this this actually was possible thanks to the the Roslyn project from Microsoft, where you can just have a, a piece of C sharp script in a string, and then at runtime compile that string into um, runnable code, and then actually run that code in in some kind of uh, backend service. The code itself looks a little bit like this. Um, so this is just a snippet of a very simple piece of code um, that stores and loads a variable called step from memory. This memory is basically the memory of the robot. Um, and each oh, three... Oh, lost your share. It's oh, no longer I'm, sharing. I'm so sorry. No, oh, no worries. Let me do that again. Um, so in this little script that I was sharing and now sharing again, um, each three steps, the robot will turn left and the other steps, it will just walk forward. So this is a very simple script that basically makes a robot walk around in circles or squares in this case, because twice it will walk forward and then the third time it will turn left because uh, if you divide the step by three, uh, if the remainder after division equals zero, it's divisible by three. So you, it, it, it turns left and then after the fact, uh, store this amount of steps in memory. Now, the reason the script looks like this is because the backend system that I created will just run these scripts for all players. This is just a script from one single player. It will run all of these scripts every two seconds. And every two seconds is one round um, within the game. So all of the robots will, will act their script, will run their scripts and act their rounds every two seconds um, at the same time. So, so that's the idea. So yeah, this I created this like. 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago to use in school. And I also used this to, to, to learn new technologies for myself, to learn Unity, um, for example. Uh, yeah, so that's the idea. You know, it's, it's interesting because before, before I know you were the guest on the show, um, I actually watched your talk on NDC about this um, yes. and about how you kind of crafted this game and you're teaching people how to you know, learn C sharp and stuff like that within this context. And I always find it interesting when folks take a whole bunch of different technologies and like smush them together to create something interesting. Because kind of like what you said, console apps are boring. Then if I do something too complicated, now I've lost context, right? Like my mind cannot follow what's happening because there's so much boilerplate wrapped around that thing. You know what I mean? So, yes. so how is it now that you are able to like, create like a focused area, you know what I'm saying? For people to say, okay, well, there's a game playing and there's some servers in the background and there's all of this stuff happening, but then you just need to focus on this little tiny part, right? And then I'll do the rest for you. Like how, like what's, what's the, what's the piece that you added on to enable us to do that? I'm not entirely sure that I, I understand your question. Um, so for, for, for me, the important part was the students, they, they only needed to focus on this, this little piece of script here. So this uh, is it, just this script, but like, yeah, how you, like, script. how are you running the script? Right. Cause they're not, they're not building a, a CS no. project, right? Like, so, what do you, no, what do you do? um, so I basically created a website that, uh, which, which acts as a front end, mm -hmm. um, and from the website, they could download a visual studio solution, which had like a, ah, okay. a, a, a base, um, just an interface basically that contains all of the contracts for the logic that they could use. And then another class that was empty with just some comment inside that said, you need to put your piece of code inside of this class. Um, and then they could just start a typing. And the reason I was doing this from within Visual Studio is because then IntelliSense could help them. So IntelliSense right, exactly. would, would tell them that there are methods available like load from memory, store in memory, turn left, walk forward, and, and others for actually attacking. So they had all of these methods available from 
um, the IntelliSense, and they could just work on the script. And I would teach them what is a variable. For example, we can store an integer into a step variable in order to use that and divide it by three and stuff like that. This was basically me teaching the very, very basics of the language C sharp. And what is an if, what is an else, what is a loop, stuff like that. So for them, the only thing that they needed to know was the code. And then the website, they would, ju they would just need to copy their code, paste it into the website, press the submit button, and then that would be sent to the backend system that would compile and run that uh, in real time. Got it. So then you, you're you using like some version of the Rosalie APIs, right? Yes. Like, like yes. read the stuff as text, right? Yes. And you get to do some compilation in the background. Yes, exactly. I will show you this uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, so of course, for my students, it was very simple. They just needed to program robots, which by the way, is not easy. It's, it's easy to create a script like this that just walks around in circles, but it's much harder to create a script that has some intelligence, like looking the arena, searching for other robots, trying to uh, navigate towards those robots who are also moving themselves. So you need to work out the shortest path to the, the, the a robot. You try, try to follow him. Um, and then actually trying to hit it hit it in the face uh, obviously so <laughs> they they needed to focus on that and i of course needed to focus on making this work making it stable in the back in in the back end and that's actually where my story relating to orleans um is heading because when i created this game the like the first version of this game um i didn't have a lot of time i still don't have a lot of time today i just wanted to create something very quickly um and it looked like this. So it was basically a front end in Unity. That's quite simple. Um, and I also didn't want to do a lot of uh, complicated things in Unity. So the front end today is just a display for what is happening. So there is no interaction there. There's no user interaction. It's not a. It's not an interactive game. Uh, the, the Unity front end just displays what happens, and you can't. Uh, use your arrow keys or your mouse to walk around, for example. You just have a static view on that arena, and the camera will slowly rotate around, as you as you've seen in my in my example. By the way, I've created a little demo for today. So this is the current C# -sharp Wars game running. So you can see the camera slowly rotating around, and I will come back to that in just a few minutes. Now. In the back end, there's three separate processes. There's an API, an HTTP API using ASP.NET Web API, which I just use for the front end to pull the current game state. So I have an endpoint that returns the game state, the entire game state as a JSON object, where you have the, the arena, the size of the arena, but also all of the robots that are inside of your arena and their statistics, like what is the name of the robot? How much health does it have remaining? How much stamina does it have remaining? Stuff like that. And then on the right-hand side, I have the web UI, which is an ASP.NET MVC, which I made back in those days for the students to use for submitting their c -sharp code, um, basically. And then on the left-hand side, I have a worker service, which is a long-running background task that just runs in a loop and will get the current game state from a database, um, will get the scripts from the database, uh, compile the scripts, run the scripts, um, and basically interprets the output from all of the scripts, combine this into a new game state, and then persist the new game state into the database once more. So that whenever the front end pulls the API, the API would get that new game state from the, from the database. So probably not the best decision to use a SQL database for this because it's not really relational data. It's just a blob of data, um, but it doesn't really matter. It worked for its purpose. Now, the problem with this was that it was not really scalable. Um, I didn't spend enough time to think about scalability and cloud beforehand. I was just running this. Um, actually, those days I was running it on, on a local Synology NAS that I have at home, running in, in Docker containers. Um, well, and you said this was 10 years ago also, yes, right? So yes. it's a different mindset, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the issue I had rather quickly was that students were not writing the most intelligent code because that's logical they're just starting out learning a new programming language or learning to to create software from scratch which is not easy um so they were making mistakes and i was basically compiling and running their mistakes on my single processor service so this became unstable sometimes it crashed sometimes it just ran too many infinite loops just crashing my entire game 
Um, so the first step that I took was to um, create a separate fourth uh, service called a validator service. And because I wanted to learn gRPC, gRPC was quite new uh, many years ago. So I thought, okay, I want to do something with gRPC. So I created a service that I could scale, a validator service. I could put multiple of these validator services next to, it, next to each other with a load balancer on top. Um, and then the web UI, before sending the actual C-sharp script to the database, would first call the validator and validate the script which meant the script needs to be able to be compiled within, I, th I think, 50 milliseconds or something. And it would also run a couple of scenarios on top of that script. So I would have some demo scenarios with multiple robots running uh, on top of that script. And if the script successfully finished also within a couple of milliseconds, I would, I would the validator would tell the web UI, this is fine. You can actually deploy this to the database. Um, and I could see that Again, when running in containers, like and today when running in Kubernetes, for example, if a validator becomes unstable because there's some bad code being added to it, well, we can just take that validator down, spin up a new one, um, and this will not impact the actual processor. But the processor itself was still, the prob still a problem because it's a single worker service. When I run it, when I spin it up, it will just get all the state from the database and it will compile and run all of the scripts. If I run two processors simultaneously, they will do the exact same work twice, which is not what we call scalable. They should, um, before we should put the work on a queue or something. And then from that queue, each processor can take some work and do some of the work. And then at the end combine um, the state again. So yeah, I didn't really have time at, at the, at that point in time to to make it really scalable by using a queue for example so i just worked on this i just used this like it is today because most cases i had 20 students 20 students i was running fine um, of course when i when i would run it in, in on a conference with with multiple hundreds of people trying to play the game yeah that that wouldn't really that wouldn't really work and this is actually where orleans came in so I wasn't familiar with Orleans, and I know Orleans already exists for, for a decade, um, but it was only last year, beginning of last year, that I, I saw a couple of Microsoft presentations on Orleans, and it really intrigued me. Um, and the problem I have with conferences and, and presentations like this in general is that the, 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 the examples that they show are always quite simple. Um, and I always try to create examples while doing presentations on my own that are a little bit more close to real life so that you could actually see um, the, the, the impact of, of, of what these technologies can do. So I decided the first time I saw the presentation from Microsoft uh, on Orleans, okay, I'm going to rewrite my C Sharp Wars game using Orleans because Microsoft promises that it will actually be scalable um, and, and I can do that in, a, in a, quite a simple way. I was I was scared when when starting with this um, because Microsoft promised it would be easy, but yeah, that's that's another thing a promise. <laughs> um, so yeah, I told my wife. I think I love the summer, honesty. I love the honesty. <laughs> this is great. Uh, I told my wife in the summer in summer holiday I'm going to take uh, two months to rewrite my C Sharp Wars game using Orleans. Uh, hopefully, it will be finished in September because then I have a presentation on it. Um, and she told me, yeah, whatever, uh, have, have fun. <laughs> and I started, I started to rewrite. And to be, to, be, to be honest, it only took me about two weeks. And after two weeks, I showed my wife, I said, look, it's actually working. It's finished. Microsoft was right. It's actually quite easy to use. Uh, so cool. very, she, she was very happy because then we could spend some time together <laughs> instead of me in my home office uh, by myself. <laughs> Um, that's the idea. And I just want to show you what, what I did uh, to make that work. So I should, I should talk to our marketing team, let them know, like, like Orleans is good for programmers' married lives. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Back to your life. There you go. Orleans saved your marriage, man. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, when I, when, I, when I was looking at the uh, Microsoft presentation, um, I already knew about the, the actor model. And the actor model, where you basically um, split up your application in, into, dif into different actors. Uh, we already know all about the, the solid principles where we have stuff like single responsibility and each 
object in our in our in our uh, object model needs to have a single responsibility it needs to do one thing and it needs to do the one thing in a good way um if we translate this into the actor model which sounds um pretty logical to me each actor does one thing and does one thing very good and of course your actors can work together to reach um, your main goal what basically your application is trying to solve so in my in my c sharp wars application again because it's a game it is pretty easy to 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 put that into an actor model concept because my game also exists out of multiple actors basically you can think about that you can think about robots you can think about arenas you can think about c sharp scripts all of these can be can be actors and the concept in Orleans is based on the actor model and Microsoft calls it the virtual actor model where each actor basically always exists. Uh, and when we, when we try to um, call into this actor, depending on if it's already active or not active, um, it can get activated or it can use the already active um, actor, which, which sits in memory. Um, the actors in Orleans are actually called grains. Um, maybe to make it more confusing, I'm not sure. Um, but an actor in the actor model in Orleans is called a grain. And one grain is always identified by an identity, of course. It has some kind of behavior and it optionally, it can also have a state. So when I look at my game or when I looked at my game, I was thinking, okay, what kind of actors do we have? Um, we have players that play the game because players can have multiple robots on the arena and multiple robots for the same player, they are basically friendly, friendly robots. So they will never attack each other. Um, you basically only attack robots from a different player. That's why we have the concept of a player. A player is identified by its player name. The behavior of a player is of course, being the player, a player can log in and log out from the system and a player can also manage all of the robots. Um, and then we have a state, which is some data we want to keep in memory for our actor, or we can even persist when that actor gets deactivated by the garbage collector. Um, for a player, for example, the state can be the player name. Very simple, uh, which is also its identity. Um, I have different kinds of, um, of these um, grains or actors. I have the robot, which is also a, a grain or an actor. Um, the identity is the name of the robot. The behavior is, of course, whatever a robot can do. It can, it can act, it can do whatever it needs to do. Um, and it has a state, all of the properties for my robot, things like the name, things like the stamina and health, the location on the feet, on the arena, the action it actually is performing, stuff like that is all um, state related. And then there's also other grains like the arena and, and the script, but I will get back to that a little bit later. We have a question actually here. This is yes. good. Keep the questions coming. Uh, so Peter Morris is asking, is an actor class basically a class per entity? And uh, we want to have two actor classes if we do two state changes to a single entity type. Yeah. Um, I was the answer to that, but. Ah, okay. Go ahead, yeah, Brady. Go ahead, Brady. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, um, it, it's great. I actually, whenever I look at this and I think about a grain and, and the concept of an actor, um, it really is sort of a two class relationship. You know, you've got your state class essentially. And something that I've seen folks on the team do is they'll actually end up having, uh, like in this case, you might have a player, you know, object that essentially represents the state you want to store inside that grain, you know, class. Um, but then what I've also seen folks do is they'll have something like a service model flyweight that is essentially that player that has a different set of serialization attributes on it. Like you might want to serialize it differently in your Orleans cluster than you do, say, on HTTP wire. Um, so in, in that case, I've seen people do like almost like a service model approach. So your service model would have a couple of additional properties or fewer properties than your, your player uh, info object, which is essentially what your grain would store, uh, would have like all, all of your Orleans serialization stuff on it. So, yeah, it's not in, in, in Orleans, it's more of a two class relationship than it is a one. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Um, the cool thing about, or the cool thing that I think about, uh, where I think about in, in Orleans is this, the concept of silos, where your, um, 
your host application that runs your application and runs your grains um, is called a silo. So if you want to scale your application and you have multiple instances of all of your host applications, they all act as, a, as separate silos and those silos will work together inside of your Orleans cluster. So when I'm running my C Sharp Wars game, and I will show an example in just a few minutes, um, all of my grains will be activated spread around within this silo so i can scale up or i can scale up or i can scale down my c sharp wars application depending on the usage and the grains will be activated throughout all of these silos so now instead of my worker service when i spin up two worker service doing the same work in parallel in these silos each grain will will live and will do its own thing and it will be actually scaled uh, in that way as you can see here, I have player grains, I have arena grains, bot grains, and script grains uh, living throughout all of my silos. And then I also have validation grains. And I specified the validation grains to always live in separate silos. So whatever is being validated runs in di different host silos than the actual gameplay in order for, for some reason, I, I, I just wanted to try to, to use these heterogeneous silos um, where some grains can only be activated in some silos. So I just wanted to learn how this works. And in my idea, validation in my game is now running separately. So it could it cannot really um, make my other silos in, in, uh, in, uh, unstable um, if, if, if they would make that unstable, I'm not sure. Yeah, one of the things I love about that, that model, and, and Brady's on the team, so Brady could keep me honest. <laughs> anything I'm not supposed to say. But one of the things that I love about this, and when I started messing around with Orleans was the fact that you get almost like a like a location transparency to an mm -hmm. extent. So like imagine, hey, I have all of these services, right? And I have different instances of servers running in different places and every instance has a different silo. Hey, I could say, hey, I want you to validate this thing, but I don't need to know where that validation service actually lives like i don't need to know the address i don't need to know the port like i could just call it and then the silos because they're now interconnected right like they kind of figure mm -hmm. it out you're like okay yep. this thing that you want is over here i'm going to call it i'm going to invoke it i'm going to return the service or whatever but again if you think about it versus doing something like if i had like an http cluster or something else of the sort usually i'd have to know the address i need to know the port i need to have more information to be able to route to the right place, unless you're using like a service mesh or something, but that's a different conversation. But mm -hmm. you know, that's what you'd need to do. So for me, Orleans makes it so much easier because now I could just call things based on an interface, right? And yeah. it'll just send it to where it needs to go and, and bring it back. And I think right. that's a really powerful attribute of it that, you know, I think a lot of folks, once they get it, they're like, oh, okay, this is amazing. This makes sense, yeah. It's like you could have, you know, two servers or 10 servers, or you could have dynamic scale. You know, I don't have to ask for the Cecil grain on server 23. I just the Cecil grain and, <laughs> and I get it back from server 23 or if server 23 catches fire from mm -hmm. some other server. So, you know, or, you know, Orleans has the capability of, you know, magically, if you will, you know, putting those grains where they should be or randomly putting them where they should be, or you can orchestrate it, you know, should you choose to. Yeah, and that's that's what made it so easy for me to actually rewrite. I didn't really rewrite C Sharp Wars. I just adjusted it to use Orleans because the, my logic was already quite split up. Um, so it, it was very easy for me to put that logic in, into grains because I already had the concepts of players, arenas, bots, and scripts. Um, and indeed, the, the the fact that I only need to use that that grain factory to basically give me a, a reference to the grain um, using the identity for that grain i don't really care where that game grain comes from um, i will just get a reference to it um, and i also use the the concept of grain placement here because i thought or i read that like when grains when they live in the same silo so running on the same host within the same process um, communication between those grains which is just a, an asynchronous method call in c sharp um, i don't need to do any http i can just do a method call from one grain to the other grain, uh, from one actor to the other actor, basically. Right. Um, but if they, if those actors or those grains sure. live in the same silo, they can just call to each other in process. But if, when they live in a different silo, there's there needs to be some HTTP communication in between those two. But I don't, as a developer, I don't need to care about that. But of course, you have a, a very small overhead there because now there is there needs to be some network communication, and that's where uh, local place 
a local placement is something you can actually do. So for my specific implementation, a robot and a script are always linked together. They basically have the same identity. So a robot always has a script, one-to-one -one relationship. So I, dis I defined the script grain to have a local placement. So when a robot is being created, that's, that robot grain is being activated and it will immediately also activate a script grain with the same ID identifier. Um, and because the script grain has local placement, um, it will, it, uh, Orleans will try to um, instantiate it on the same silo. Uh, which means that communication between the robot and the script grain will be more performant um, because the robot and the script grain, they, they will do a lot of communication in my use case. Um, so I wanted to not have that um, extra um, network communication between those, those grains, if that makes sense. <laughs> so uh, when I look again at my, at my uh, architecture here, what I basically did was change the uh, worker service into an Orlean silo and also change the uh, validator service into an Orlean silo. So no more GPR, uh, gRPC, just have the same ASP.NET MVC web frontend, have the same HTTP API, but then my, uh, again, my uh, processor is now an Orlean silo and my validation is a, is, a, is a different Orlean silo and they can work together. So maybe before diving any deeper, um, Let's just try and see what happens. So I created a little website called web.csharpwars.com. I've simplified it today. Uh, and the only thing you need to do when, when visiting this website is uh, take, uh, pick a name for your robot, select a predefined script from a dropdown, um, and see what happens. Just confirming the link again, because I'm going to share it here. So it's web.csharpwars.com, right? Yep. Okay. Why isn't it dot .net? <laughs> <laughs> because now somebody else will register that uh, domain name. Right. Um, so as you can see, things are already happening. So I can see some people have actually created robots. Uh, many of you have created ranged attack robots, so they're now throwing fireballs at each other. You can <laughs> zoom in, zoom in a little bit. You can you can see I love uh, it. the name of the player, which I just uh, which is just a GUID for now because there's no player login to make things uh, simple. And then there's two bars. There's the blue bar for stamina, and there's the green bar for health. So stamina mm -hmm. means when you walk around, you will lose some stamina, you will get tired, and the green bar is your health uh, when you get hit by a fireball in this case, uh, you will lose some of your health. And when you lose all of your health, you will die. You will fall backwards <laughs> and Aww. you will see the robot lying down on the ground. And after about 10 seconds, that, that body will actually be cleaned up. Because so yeah, we, have, we, have a, we have 190 live viewers right now. Let's see if we can fill this arena up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while, while, the, while, the, while the audience is doing that, let, let me quickly show you something cool. Um, so in Orleans, there is actually a, a separate NuGet package you can install um, that will give you a, a dashboard that you can use um in your development environment where you can actually see what is happening quite visually so this on orleans.csharpwars.com a link you can also visit if you want um shows you my current orleans cluster and you can see that there's now a total of 131 activations which means 134 75 um, grains that are currently active within a total of 20 silos. So I have 20 host applications running this cluster, running in this cluster. If I go to grains, you can see all of my different kinds of grains, like players, scripts, bots, and so on. And you can see that I now have 53 players and 46 scripts and bots. So again, scripts and bots, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. So there's there's always going to be as many scripts as, as there are bots. Um, and you can also see the numbers fluctuate because people are still creating bots and robots are also dying because they get hit in the face a little bit too often. Um, if you go to silos, you can see all of your host applications. And all of my applications are part of my Orleans cluster. So I basically have one or I think two web APIs. Um, I have one web application 
And then I have a bunch of uh, validation hosts and regular hosts. And you can see for each host how many activations that host has. So my regular host application has around 20 activations because Orleans will automatically spread all of those grains um, inside of all of the active silos um, automatically for you. So it will spread around that um, processing power, um, well, basically. We, real quick, Johnny, we do have yeah. uh, some people here saying that they've deployed the robot, but they don't see anything. So they, they, I mean, rather than watching our screen, they could, uh, from your website, download the 3D arena to see it locally, right? Yes. Yes, okay. they, they, they could. Yeah. So from the website, there is a, there is a zip file containing this front end uh, in Unity, and that should work. But I, actually, I haven't tested it for a long time because it, this is now a newer version. Um, which has a, ah, okay. a variable camera because in order to do this presentation, I increased the size of the arena. Uh, beforehand, it was only 10 by 10 by 10 or 8 by 8. So I made some changes. So maybe that's the reason why it doesn't work. You scaled um, it out. I scaled, I scaled it out. I scaled it out. I actually wrote a little script to deploy 500 robots to, to test the past weekend that it also, it also worked. Yeah, cool. um, so so there, people are saying, so it's not really a web app. The, no. I mean, the, since it's no. Unity, couldn't you it technically? Should be, it should be easy to to create like a, a a web app out of that. Yeah, I could yeah. I could do that, but I've never tried before. So it's a and, it's a good suggestion. I'll, it's open source. I was curious about something. One of the one of the pieces of guidance that Orleans team always gives folks is, you know, don't have a client like you know Johnny's Unity app uh, that connects directly to your to your Orleans cluster. So I'm just kind of curious, like, how does that part actually connect to your cluster? Does it use something else? Yeah, that's the API basically. Okay. Um, so when I go back to the presentation, um, here you can see that my front end in Unity connects to the HTTP API, the, the web API. And I will show you in code right now um, if I can find my Visual Studio. So um, as I told you, I have indeed in or my Orleans um, uh, folder, I have my host and my validation host application. I will show you the details for the host application in just a, in just a few moments. Um, but I also have my web API, and my web API is using a minimal API that has a method um, called get arena get arena bots. So this method is used by Unity, and Unity will call this uh, endpoint every two seconds. And every two seconds, this endpoint will return a JSON containing all of the information that Unity needs to draw the current game state. Now, of course, the question is, how does this API communicate with my Orleans cluster? So, well, first of all, the thing that I did was to make my API a part of my Orleans cluster. And the thing mm -hmm. you need to do for, for that is calling use Orleans on top of your host application. So use Orleans with then uh, some configuration, like where do you want to keep st uh, state stored? So I use Azure storage, Azure blob storage to, to store my state. I also have some configuration that I can make it run on Kubernetes or Azure container apps. I will show you again that uh, in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. you, you specify the, the cluster name um, and you specify some, some things like logging and using the dashboard. So this back basically means that my web API can now be part of the Orleans cluster that has these identifiers. Um, now, my host application, so my silos that actually run my grains, they do the same thing. It's also an uh, it's also an, uh, a web host application or a host application in in .NET. It also uses the use Orleans in the same way. The same configuration is here. Um, it also uses that same um, dashboard and it configures that same Orleans cluster uh, identifier. So when you um, start these two applications, they will be able to find each other within their environment uh, if you if you run them. Now, inside there was a of the question, real quick, I wanted to yes, put yes. this up real quick. Uh, one of our viewers, TJ, is asking what the, the performance uh, implications are when you know building a game on top of Orleans. So I just wanted to state real quick that uh, you've heard of Halo before, I assume. And Gears. And Gears of War, mm -hmm. uh, th things like that. Those games use Orleans, so very performant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't really have any issues. 
um, with creating this game using Orleans. Um, I am running it now in many, many silos as an example, but that is actually not necessary. I can just run it in one or maybe two silos uh, for a couple of hundred robots, and that would that would work perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I was I was talking about um, how would the API connect to my grains, my 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 silos. So when I go to the implementation for this, let's call it business logic method, get arena uh, thing, the grain factory. But I made an abstraction on top of that called the grain client. Um, this is an extension method that I created myself um, from grain, which basically tells me find me a grain um, for the arena that has this, this identifier, so this unique identifier with the name of the arena, and on top of that grain, call the method get arena details. Now, if you look at get arena details, this method lives on top of the actual grain class. So this class, arena grain, is actually the, the actor in my Orleans um, application. So it derives from a base grain class from Orleans itself, and it also implements from an interface. And this interface specifies the contract for your grains, and then this clause is obviously the implementation for that. And then I also have a persistent state, which is that second uh, class that I use to actually store all of the state for this arena. So the clause itself is called the arena state, and when your grain um, is activated, it will get that state from the storage, which in my case is Azure Blob Storage. Um, and whenever I want, I can save that state back into Blob Storage. And then when the grain goes, uh, gets deactivated and then in a later stadium gets reactivated, it will fetch that same state that was uh, persisted and actually will inject it using constructor uh, dependency injection. And I will have that state uh, available again. So in this case, um, get arena details. Um, it will just return the state of that arena, the width and the height uh, of the arena and, and the name for that. Now, whenever I want to get all of the robots, I have a separate endpoint called get all active robots. For this method thing, it will get the arena grain itself um to get all of the active robots for a specific arena because basically my game is is built so that you can run multiple arenas simultaneously um so you so each unity client can connect to one single arena and you can have multiple arenas running simultaneously so this will actually get all of the active robots not by querying all the robot grains directly no it will go via the arena grain so within the arena grain i also have the method get all active robots Again, we are in the same arena grain as before, uh, but now I have a, a help, helper method called get robots that will actually loop through all of the robot IDs which are stored within the state of the arena. And it for each robot ID, it will get a specific robot grain to get the state from the robot. And now it combines all of these robot grains and it will return all of those back to the caller. I'm actually glad you showed this because it, it brings up a question I've heard from a lot of other folks around how do I query my grains, right? Like I have a lot of stuff, like I don't know, let's say it's customers, right? I have a 200 customers and each of them are represented as grains. How do I query the customers, right? Because they're all different instances of things. And I like this pattern because it almost looks like your arena grain acts kind of sort of like a registry, kind of, but not really, but kind of like a registry so that, hey, I and know that these things are here, right? Yeah. So now it makes it easier for me to execute that query because I don't have to like loop through some other mechanism to try and find out, okay, well, what grains do I have? Or what what instances of things do I have? And then now I gotta dive into that and get properties and like, like just more work needs to happen. So this is actually a really good pattern I think you're highlighting here just to show how I could like execute some types of queries, right? And be able to get information back about the state of my actual running application. Yeah. yeah. And that's also the reason why, for example, there's a robot grain and a script grain. Uh, I decided to split out the the, the logic from for robots. It's uh, like a robot is a state. The robot, the only thing a robot can do is what is my health, what is my stamina, what is my name, stuff like that. The reason I split out the actual scripting logic is because compiling and running the C sharp script takes a lot of time. 
Um, and a cool feature in Orleans is the fact that each crane is, is single threaded by default. So you don't have any problems with state. Uh, there's, there's no multiple callers that will go for the <clears throat> same grain at the same time. So I have some, some issues with locking my state and stuff like that. That's not the case. When you have someone calling into your grain, it will first complete all, all of it, what it needs to do before the next caller can actually get inside of your grain. So it will basically queue your request within uh, a single grain which also meant that when I put my scripting logic inside of my robot grain, when my arena asks my robot, what are your, what are your details? And that robot was at that time running its script, it would wait until running the script was finished. So because I split out it in a separate uh, processing grain, that processing grain can do whatever it wants in the background and my robot grain would, would still be uh, available for me to ask the current robot um, state. So basically, that's why when the robot grain gets activated or gets created, it immediately also creates the script grain. And I will show you. So in my grains, I have my script grain. Uh, and when the script grain itself gets activated, it will actually compile my script for execution. Mm -hmm. So on activation, it first compiles, which, which takes the most time. But then mm -hmm. when, when the grain keeps active in memory, I'm not going to recompile it again because I only need to compile it once and then it can remain in memory. And the only thing that I, that I need to do is when I process it, I can invoke the script that's already compiled. So each two seconds, I'm just running the script. I don't need to recompile the script. The recompiling only happens when the grain gets deactivated and gets reactivated in the future. Then first it will compile and then I can just very easily process it multiple times over and over again. Awesome. This is great. cool. I, I, I like that you do that on startup. That's kind of cool. Each screen starts up. Yeah. And it is something you can see happen when you deploy your robot to the arena. You, you will see sometimes when, you're, you're, when your script is quite complex yeah. that it takes a couple of moves be before your robot actually starts doing something. So first, it's just thinking about what, what am I going to do? Because in the background, the, the grain is actually uh, compiling the script and then when the script is successfully compiled then it will be taken up in that process of running the script each two seconds and then it will your robot will actually start doing stuff yeah i i think i've mentioned this to you and uh, one of the other conversations we've had on this awesome app but i think it would be really cool if you had a web app okay somebody's already posted a thing in here you can you can output your unity app to webgl so that's idea yeah i know one. yeah i know uh, um, i've never tried it before but i know when when building from unity you can just do webgl and then yeah. i can incorporate it in my website which is yeah. basically a very good idea and i really need to do it yeah, yeah. It'd be cool uh the other idea i think i think we've talked about this before is to have some form of uh i don't want to say web-based ide we've already done that uh but to kind of take one of our try.net you know components or something and set it up so I could, you know, name my bot and then actually just type in my code and hit deploy. And it would tell me if it worked or didn't work. You know, like if, if that compile event fails, it could bark back, hey, doesn't work, you know, or, or validate it in some way. The validation would be really hard. Like you just have to bail on that at first. I think that'd be neat. So people could actually write their own, their own bot and deploy it. Uh, I've got lots of, uh, lots of ideas. Like I was thinking to myself, it'd be really cool if inside your little scripting bits where, you know, maybe you're validating client side, but I could throw an HTTP client in there and I could go do a web request and maybe get some intelligence, you know, like people keep talking about chat GPT in here. Like I've, the chat's just blowing up with AI and, um, you know, you're talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. bots already. Like it'd be cool to have something that's like, you know, playing with actual bots that have actual AI driven behind it. Uh, TJR asked a question, uh, or TJ underscore R underscore asked a question. Uh, can this be implemented on a non-relational database if the grains are stored as blobs? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's one of the great things about Orleans, uh, is that not only the the silos communication data, uh, but also the individual grain persistence data, as you've seen with Johnny's code, uh, that just gets persisted to a you know persistence layer. You can you can snap in any persistence layer that you want Azure table storage Azure blob storage you could write your own uh, there's a couple of great books that have come out on Orleans in the last year uh, one of those actually walks through the process of creating your own uh, that sits on top of the file system so yeah it's essentially essentially your persistence layer 
is irrelevant, you know, you know, or Orleans knows what to do with it. So, so the answer to your question is yes, you, you could use relational, non-relational Redis, whatever we support yeah. for the grain. Persistence. So, so I decided to use Azure blob storage. And as you can see here, yeah. I'm connected to my blob storage. You have a grain state, and then you can basically create as many, um, how to call it, um, buckets where you want to put so i decided to create a bucket for each kind of grain so i have arena grains which is only one which is the default arena um and then inside of this arena we have robots and they just have a unique identifier for all of them so it's just json blobs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um persisting my state for each of, of those robots mm -hmm. And that's what what you're showing here is is like a tool that's great to have if you're if you're building any Orleans app. Just use the Storage Explorer for stuff. You know you can run it locally, and if something blows up, you can just delete it. Uh, you know, just get don't get in the habit of connecting to your live Azure when and deleting that because then it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. But you've you never know. done that before, have you, Brady? Uh, that's that's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, never in production. Thank God. <laughs> and, act and, and actually, to, to connect back to whatever uh, you were saying, David, in the beginning of this episode, um, this is actually running in Azure Container Apps. So I, I have my four host applications, website, web API, validation host, and host running in four separate um, Azure Container Apps mm -hmm. that share the same um, Azure Container environment. So they, they, they are hosted within the same shared environment, so they know how to find each other. Um, and inside of this, for example, you can very easily uh, scale. Um, so you can scale manually. And I can show you here that, let's go, let's go, <laughs> that I now have exactly 12 replicas running for my Orleans host. And this is what you see in the Orleans dashboard when you go to mm -hmm. silos. If you would count all of the uh, Azure Container Apps, C Sharp Wars, Orlean host applications, this would be 12 of them. And if you change this value by editing and redeploying, um, you would see immediately from your Orleans dashboard that this gets um, rescaled for you automatically. Um, of course, there you can actually do automatic scaling using Keda, um, where you can build some of your own rules if you want. And I think Brady, you have a you have a YouTube video about that. Um, yeah, I was thinking about sending you a PR. Like maybe we get to like ten users per per ACA, and then it scales or something like that. Yeah, something like that. I I actually want to look into that where depending on how many robots are deployed or or maybe how many arenas are, are currently active that we can auto scale and increase the number of um, silos that are currently active that wouldn't be too hard have you built a uh, azd template for this yet i think that'd be really cool. no not yet uh, okay okay i need to do that that'd be really great yeah so, um we could collaborate um, on that. I'm not sure how many time we have left. I just wanted to mention that specifically for this episode, I've created um, a GitHub repository. So that's building a game with .NET and Orleans for uh, .NET Live 2023. Um, you can find it when going to my GitHub page. Um, <clears throat> and the C Sharp Wars one is already quite complicated. It, it, it uses a lot of concepts. Um, if you want to have a, a simpler look into um, Orleans, I've actually this weekend or past weekend decided to create a second uh, little application that I just very quickly want to show where I built like a multiplayer snake um, using Orleans. And this is not, this is code that runs locally. So I have one host application, so one um, Orleans silo, and I have a WinForms, yay, WinForms uh, client <laughs> application. <laughs> Love that. I'm, I love the, it I'm, was like fake enthusiasm though. Come on. It was. <laughs> no, 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 no. I really love Like when, when, for some reason, when I need to do something very quickly with a UI that needs yeah. to look a little bit decent, I always go back to WinForms because I'm. Oh, I love that. When I was working in .NET originally in 20, uh, 2002, uh, I was doing a lot of uh, WinForms. So when I run this, it, uh, it's a snake game. So when you look at grains, I have things like a game, a player, and a processing grain. And when I run it, come on, computer, you can do it. Do it. Do it runs it. The, the host application, of course. Mm -hmm. And this, this one is actually using, this one is using um, Signal R. Ah, okay. So 
I can run multiple clients at the same time. And the concept is quite simple, where I can start a new game from one client, type my name, create the game. My computer has a hard time. Oh, my host was not running yet. Oh. This was actually how Kevin Pilch learned uh, the former EM for the team. When we acquired Orleans, he actually built a snake game to learn how to do it, but his was on the web. Um, yeah, why, why do web when you have web forms? Just quickly. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> Sorry. I just I only had a couple of hours and really wanted to do to do something that worked, so that's why I chose to use WinForms. <laughs> For what it's worth, Kevin had problems with his app too. That's okay. Must be the game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's wait for the host application to st to start up. There we go. Did you start it without running debugging? Two things at, at the same time. Sorry. Uh -oh. No, I started with debugging. Yeah, that's probably a lot faster so, than I thought it. So this is one game, and I can join an existing game based on the game code A77EB8. And then this one is the other player. They can join the game, and then they just have to specify when they are ready. And when an, all players are ready, they are playing the game together. Oh. Nice. Oh, nice! That's cool. I love cool. that. So it's very basic. It, it doesn't it, it doesn't really look that good, um, but it's using Orleans in the in the background, and it's using Signal R to send um, the game state to all of the clients. So that's why the clients will will be synchronized, basically. Th this looks great. Yeah, I mean, you're you're downplaying it, but this is wind cool. forms with Signal R and Super Orleans good. and lot. Like, come on, this is great. This is fantastic. You've got web in there. You've got signal in there. It's all yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, for 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 people who want to start a little bit easier um, on, uh, with Orleans, this is just a very simple um, application, which is also on my GitHub uh, within the same repository. You just have the client, the host, and some contracts that are shared in between those two. I just want to see how you drew your grid. It's perfect, right? And when forms, I keep thinking the same thing. Like, how did they do it? Like, what? <laughs> Your patience is impressive. <laughs> Just a bunch of crappy for four loops. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Wait, each cell should be a grain. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. oh, that's amazing. Well, cool. Um, yeah, this has been great. We're almost to our time box. So I just wanted to thank you, Johnny, for coming on. This was amazing. I learned a lot. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any other questions that are coming in. A few things. <laughs> uh, question here. Does Microsoft still promote fluid framework? I think so. I don't, know, I don't even know what that is. I think nope. so. Uh, no. Is that, that the CSS thing? I think that's what that is, right? I think that's what it is. Maybe. I'm not sure. Isn't that what... Rob's look. I gotta look that up. Fluid framework. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um. Anyways, well, this has been great. Uh, much appreciated, Johnny. You were fantastic. I learned a lot. Uh, I think we'll say our goodbyes. What do you guys think? Yeah. Thanks for watching. Bye, friends. Take care. Bye, bye. Be safe.